This is a Chronicle podcast, bringing you ideas in the service of medicine. Greetings and welcome to Sheer Listening Pleasure with your host, me, Neil Shear. I'm a recently retired academic dermatologist. Over my career, I have been inspired by my many colleagues and trainees who are dedicated to helping people with major life-altering skin conditions. Some people don't recognize dermatology as a real medical specialty. Oh, but is it ever? From the many stories of patients and providers, I hope we can inspire others. We will travel across Canada to delve into inspirational contributions to improve the quality of life of others. Very few specialties have as many diverse diseases as dermatology. So without any gory photos, just friendly chats, we will take you into a world behind the scenes, a world of caring, compassion, and inspiration. And of course, I want to give a very special shout out to our sponsors supporting the podcast from Amgen Canada. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. With knowledge beyond measure, discussions you will treasure. It's sheer, sheer, sheer listening pleasure. So, Aaron, these started serendipitously, but the idea was to have a chance to talk to people who are making major contributions to dermatology in a very number of ways in Canada right now. And I suppose we could go beyond that. You flatter me by inviting me. I've listened to all the episodes. I'm a huge fan. (laughs) You're so kind. I mean, but I was thinking about some of the things that I've learned in talking to people about this and their stories. And so I just thought I would just write it down a little bit. What we're sort of looking at as a broad theme, besides recognizing your experience and expertise and, and all those contributions, but your own evolutionary journey, I called it, you know, basically the kind of thing is, how did I ever get here? And it's the kind of thing you, especially when you retire, if you think I'm no longer there, how did I even get there? And that, I just call that the evolutionary journey. The other thing is, as you can expect, there's been a focus on diversity and equity. And that's not just in practice, but in teaching and in uh, all sorts of everything in what we do and included you know, we go every, everywhere across the country, language, indigenous populations, all kinds of things, but they're different for different people. So it's been interesting to hear how people may have different perspectives on the focus on diversity and equity. And so it's a personal journey, basically a personal journey of, you know, what you've gone through to get to this stage in your career and the things you've learned, contributions to teaching and understanding the issues, because you know you, you know yourself for many years of doing exams, that you do the exam and then real life has nothing to do with that. And then you're being taught stuff and you find out also it had nothing to do with reality. And you start to create your own reality. And then how do you turn that into an action? So that's sort of this. So you know, for people listening, how did Aaron Dahlke end up in dermatology of all things? Yeah. You know, that's funny. And yeah, thanks for having me on. And you know, to take it back, I did my undergrad at Dalhousie and I did my medical school at Western and I went to U of T for residency. You know, actually, I don't know if you remember, well, one of the reasons I even actually got hooked up with a dermatologist in the first place in first year medical school was because an email I wrote to you, sort of cold calling you, and then you hooked me up with Christian Murray and then, um, you know, the rest is history. And I fell in love with surgical dermatology and then I fell in love with medical dermatology, working with Scott Walsh, like so many of us have. And, you know, residency was a beautiful time. It was a great time at U of T and it was, it was such a great group and, and such a, a place for supportive learning. You know, after residency, I did a fellowship and master's degree part-time over three years and had, you know, two kids in that period too. And, um, and then you sort of hit real life. And what's interesting is after that, when, you know, I was working at a number of hospitals And my goal really was building this practice at St. Joe's. And I think I did, you know, an unofficial master's degree in my mind, uh, uh, you know, this healthcare administration master's degree. 
just on the ground running to really work on getting a program up and running, like how to build a program and working with hospitals and managers and directors and leadership and foundation and, you know, different programs and, and how to advocate and, and build a purpose that people can get behind. So that really was also sort of a piece of education for me. And I did the education piece. I was running the pre-clerkship medical school at U of T from 2016 until now. And then I took over sort of the full undergrad UT leadership during COVID. And, and now I'm just in the process of actually handing that off, which is fantastic. And that has also led to a whole bunch of work in the EDI realm that you know a little bit about. And my clinical work, you know, is mostly St. Joe's and in Kingston. I'm in Kingston right now doing a, a lot of Mohs micrographic surgery. And then I also do complex medical dermatology, which I love too. That's really remarkable. I Just to go back a bit about St. Joseph's, obviously St. Joseph's has not really in the primary hub of downtown, you know, dermatology and, and medicine and that, and yet is a very special place. And I have to say that probably the most devoted group of people and staff I've ever seen when walking in to do an audit or whatever you're doing was at, at St. Joe's. I mean, it was just so unbelievably collegial and important. So it's part of Unity Health. Is that correct? That's right. Now it's part of Unity Health. And I would say that that you're absolutely right, that that culture, it's palpable. And as far as I'm concerned, I think that has maintained since, you know, the merger or the conglomeration with Providence and St. Mike's. And it will continue to evolve because there's going to be a new building. You know, there, there's going to be more sort of joining of the teams o- over the years. And there is some pushback against that. But that culture is there and it, it's a fantastic place to work and be part of. I'm so glad to hear that they're fixing it up. I'm sure other people the first time walking into St. Joe's would think they were walking onto the scene of a horror movie. But then when you get there, it's true. Though. It's just, I just can't believe it. The people were so, everybody, for me down in medical records and wherever I was, it was so friendly. And for the neighborhood, which is a large population, a very diverse group of people in that catchment area, to have such wonderful care, and if need be, a beautiful view of uh, Lake Ontario. But yeah, the view is only from the the parking lot, which is quite scary. <laughs> <laughs> but all in all, uh, St. Joseph's has really been just having you adding on to there. And as you know, we've got a few people working there in dermatology and committed to it. And it's so complicated. Dermatology is so complicated. Yeah. And having, you know, leadership who appreciates dermatology. And, and now we have um, Catherine Sybil, who's coming to do a, a little bit with us there. So I'm, I'm hoping she stays and does more. And I mean, I have had experience with other hospital systems, but there's a lot of, you know, more yes and than no but. Like, let's find a way to make this work. You're right, the walls are falling down, but like, let's find a way to build the Mohs lab and, and make it work. And it's been great. That's a nice way to put it. Because I know when I went and I was meeting with the head of medicine, one of the things was his, I almost keep questioning it. I go, do I understand it? Are you really supportive of dermatology? Because the other people in Unity Health are the exact opposite. If you go to St. Mike's, they're antagonistic towards dermatology. I hate to say, but it's true, and it always has been. And so here, you know, you have people who are supportive of dermatology, recognize the need for this, and which is really very much not just filling in a blank. I mean, it really helps patients. And then you, you're doing most surgery there, removing skin cancers and dealing with all these complicated cancer patients and medical patients. And I would love for this to be the model for community hospitals. You know, I would love for people to come out of residency and have a community hospital in their area that they can support and the hospital supports them in whatever way it is. But, you know, new grads are not going to support hospital dermatology without a little bit of a give and take. And, you know, that, that can be teased apart in many different ways, what that looks like. But, you know, people aren't able to run a, a business on their own, a small business and support the hospital. So, you know, and hospital dermatology is so fantastic. I mean, the cases are incredible. And, you know, the, the care we can provide, the diagnoses we can provide, you know, getting on an SJS early and preventing it, you know, just to be be present and, and to be able to support the hospital. I, I mean, that's, that's what I would love for Ontario and Canada. That's really well said. Because geographically, if you understand, it's in the west part of the city. And when you think of the downtown hospitals, yes, there are a lot of high rises and people live there. But these are people, you know, in houses and all that stuff scattered around there who do live there and they're on the ground, if you will. And they really depend on the hospital 
but depend on it in, in a lot of different areas from childbirth, et cetera, to the end of life type of thing. So it's a really a spectrum, but it is nice to see that even me as coming in as an outsider, you know, you can see the difference right away. And, uh, and obviously it's really good. And I think, you know, Catherine coming to do pediatric stuff there too, it'll, I'm sure it'll impact her too. She's, you just have to, you know, embrace that vibe there and go with it. It's just amazing. So Mm -hmm. And working with uh, really great uh, directors and managers right now. I mean, I've been there for, I think, three different leadership groups now. So, you know, keeping the momentum going, but yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, you know what it's like, right? I mean, you were doing that at Sunnybrook for <laughs> forever. Yeah. And at Queen's University. So what's your, besides coming in and doing the Mohs surgery, what else are you doing at Queen's? Because that's a pretty unique thing to be both at something like St. Joe's and at Queen's University. Yeah, I mean, I would say I, I'm doing most of my academic contribution, you know, and the EDI work was really from U of T. But I have to say that Kingston also is, is such a fantastic program. And there is a big push for equity work, you know, here in Kingston as well. I'm in Kingston today. And my clinical work here is amazing. Like you wouldn't believe the cancer and the need, you know, the need for Durham and the need for cancer care and modes, and especially sort of in this post pandemic period. I mean, I was working the whole way through. I never stopped, but but people stopped coming. And if biopsy proven cancers that are referred, so people stopped getting biopsied, you know, they they didn't want to see their family doctors, then they couldn't see their family doctors. The tumors are still there, they're getting bigger. So, you know, just just slammed. And it's the nicest people in the world. Like I just I love serving this population here in the East. It's so great. And it's a great setup and the clinic is great and the facilities are great. The walls are not falling apart. <laughs> yeah. I know having worked in many different areas during training, when I was moonlighting downtown, there are certain places who, you know, you would see somebody who had something bad, but they're going to debate with you what's going on. And you go, what? no, I, I know what's going on. And I want to tell you that. And, and that happens a little bit. But also having been to Queens and seeing what it's like in the clinics and the, the enthusiasm and experience and, and just really nice people in the department just to see how the staff who work there who aren't in dermatology, whether it's they're working in the kitchens or they're working anywhere, they all seem to know each other. It's like this big family thing. And yeah, and I've done Mo's on half of them. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, well, that's good. Too. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good way to get to know your team. It's really something. It wasn't confronting people. You know, they were like, listen, I've got a problem and, and I hear you can help me. And you go, yes, we can. That's really terrific. And I mean, cancer. I mean, that's the thing that people just don't, you know, remember that dermatologists see these horrible cancers. And certainly the literature is now filled with all kinds of things, I mean, more about squamous cell carcinomas, but other cancers. And so it's an area that's certainly evolving, but it's always been there. And to be able to cure these people is just fantastic. And then be able, if you have to clean things up, they're right there and you go there. So that's really good. I mean, I, for you to be able to keep that up back and forth is a challenge, I'm sure, but obviously it's worth it. It's a lot of time to listen to podcasts. So, you know, I'm all caught up. That's amazing. That is terrific. And and you were talking about medical school training and the, if you will, the diversity program and thing as you went through. Can you go through a bit for people who are listening about what happened there? Because again, this was a win. You've had a lot of great wins. I have to, I'm very envious. And it was a great win to get the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto to say, yeah, we'll support that. But what happened there? Yeah, I mean, that's a nice way to put it. But yeah, no, so the curriculum, the medical school curriculum, we, you know, we redid it in 2016 when I came in and it was a visual based curriculum. And I inherited this curriculum and it built it up. And then, you know, we had some very astute medical students recognize that there was a lack of skin of color images, images of skin diseases and brown skin in the curriculum. And so this was like initially a, a student driven initiative. So, we, you know, we took that feedback and we're like, you know what, you're right, there is. And, and this was back in, in 2018, you know, for George Floyd, before a lot of this sort of came to light and all the amazing things that are happening in dermatology right now. So, you know, from that sense, it was nice that we were a little bit ahead of the curve on, on some of this. So, you know, we took that feedback. We did a study looking at, okay, well, let's look at what our curriculum is like. And it, it was atrocious, as you would expect, you know, it was less than it was like 7% of our images were clear, obvious skin of color images, which is, you know, Toronto, 50% of our population is a visible minority, it's just not okay. So, and then a, a whole snowball of things that came out of that, which, you know, at first, you're like, well, this is an easy fix, let's just make our curriculum more diverse. 
but it, it's not necessarily that easy. I mean, one thing is a lot historically of our textbooks didn't even have that many images of skin of color demonstrating, you know, common diseases that you would see across all skin types. So, you know, even just getting pictures and then updating material and then updating, you know, pre-recorded videos, not just, you know, changing a few PowerPoint slides, a whole lot more in depth than that. I was lucky enough to partner with an amazing medical student who has a lot of sort of knowledge in anti-oppression work that they've done in the past and helped, you know, inform some of these changes from a broader sense, like stepping back, you know, saying, okay, well, you know, we can fix the curriculum, but why was that problem there? You know, why historically do we not have these images in our textbooks? And, you know, you could say, oh, you know, it's easier to see redness and erythema on white skin, but it, it's racism too, you know, it, and that you have to address. You can't just say, okay, you know, that's the past we're not gonna do in the future. We just look back, oh, why is this? And what does that mean for our patients? You know, most dermatologists, I think, would be able to recognize most skin conditions across all skin types by the time they're a dermatologist. But what about primary care doctors and the eMERGE doctors? And I mean, this is something we've talked about before. You know, I know you have an opinion on this, too. So there's a lot of work to be done. And so addressing the root cause and then how to integrate that in our Dermatology Week curriculum, where we're already teaching quite a lot of stuff in one week, was something we took on. And, and, and there's still more work to be done, but I'm glad that the work is happening and it's ongoing. And I think we're better, we're, you know, our curriculum is much better than it was two, three years ago. And I think there's still more room for growth. It's sort of a body of work that I'm quite proud of and proud that I was involved in. And yeah, and you know, I think you had told me once, you don't ever regret any education that you get, you know, you're sometimes you're like, Oh, well, why am I doing this degree, but you never regret it. And, and same with this, like, you never really know what work you're going to end up doing. I don't think I would have expected that I would be doing anti-oppression work, you know, when I took on medical education, but it's something I'm really happy that I fell into and, and was able to support. It's amazing. I, you know, I will say it's, I would say it's never too late to do the right thing. And when you see this with all the different things over the years where we tried to do it and had meetings with people ahead of education there, I have to say one of them, all of these things are eye-openers too, though, right? Like they just sort of shine a light in a dark place. You didn't even know it existed. And I'm talking to three of the top educators for the Department of Medicine about what we were trying to do. And this is before you had all this great success. But then I said, you realize that visual learning is different than rote learning. And three people who have like advanced degrees in education were shocked. They had no concept of what visual learning was and the challenges of visual learning but it was an eye opener for me. I, I just like, I, I was the one who didn't know anything. I was like, seriously, you don't. So I'm not going to get into nuances of things like pareidolia and all kinds of fancy things about what visual learning is. I think as dermatologists, it, most of us are innately visual learners. You know, I was always a visual learner. Like when I did notes, I would draw pictures in the notes and then I'd picture my notes. And then when I'd see someone else learn something by, instead of drawing a rainbow, they'd write out the letters for the colors of the rainbow. I just, yeah, I don't know. You're right, though, because it's like, you know, I said, excuse me, but what do you think about radiology? And what do you think about pathology? And these groups, they, that's what they do. They look at things. They're not just looking at a lab result. It's, it's 12 and it was supposed to be six. You know, it's not that. A machine doesn't tell them what to do. They have to be able to actually recognize it, let alone all the different nuances that you mentioned and, and the challenges, of course, with trying to understand things across the spectrum, which makes a difference. But certainly things... Things are changing. They're not, we're not there yet, but they're, they're certainly changing. And getting the medical students fired up about it, I think is just... Oh, they keep you on your toes. It's great. I love it. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> uh, will you be more humbled than when you teach medical students? <laughs> well, you know what? That's the best way to teach is by learning. You know, you learn yourself and you think, wait a minute, what am I doing wrong? Or why is this not resonating? And, you know, there's all these different things, but it's really... And then, of course, the pandemic and all that stuff changed so many of these kinds of interactions, the teaching tools, things like using Zoom and everything like that has made it different, not necessarily worse, but but different. And we're not out of it yet. We'll see what happens. But I'm really glad that you're able to continue to do all your surgery, at least, you know, trying to catch up. I assume it's challenging. There must be quite a waiting list for the most surgery. Yeah, waiting lists are funny. You know, they go up and down and there's a lot of external factors, especially when you're a referral-based service and things are affecting 
the referrals. So, you know, if the derms aren't working or if the family doctors aren't working and how those waves went up and down in the pandemic, I mean, a little bit of it was like me de- being displaced. I stayed working the whole time in the pandemic. I never stopped. You know, I did lose some hospital based services like space and nursing and mostly at St. Joe's, but Kingston, I was working the whole time. Me and the the truckers on the 401, the only ones driving across the highway. <laughs> you couldn't stop. There were no bathrooms. No, that's really great. And I think, you know, just to hear the people's practices and the enthusiasm in teaching and learning and the diversity of what we do, it's just really special. And, I, and I'm just so in awe of what people have been able to do and to continue to, you know, take action in areas that are making a difference for patients and for better care, better recognition. And it's different. I mean, obviously, the geography of Canada is quite diverse. So there's going to be a lot of differences depending where you are and what's expected. I had a day, um, this was a few years ago, because now my practice is a little different, but I had a day or no, I had a week where I I did like an interpolation pedicle flap in Mohs. We had a patient with glyptin induced BP. We ended up giving rituxan on the floor. And then this was when I was still working in the community and I had, you know, community bread and butter dermatology, like acne, rosacea, toxins, all in the same week. And I felt like I was a real dermatologist with a capital D that week, you know, like I was doing the breadth of dermatology and it, it was nice. And I love having a focused practice too, which is now mostly Mohs and complex medical dermatology, mostly inpatients, not so much outpatient, except for those follow ups, because those BP patients don't go away. But yeah, no, I think we have an amazing specialty and there's so much you can do. Yeah, I'm just glad when people, our colleagues outside of dermatology, recognize that, you know what, let's just, let's ask the dermatologist. And, and I remember when I was doing my early training in uh, McMaster in Hamilton, the uh, head of medicine would refer cases to us, which had nothing to do with dermatology, but he didn't know what was going on and he thought maybe we would, <laughs> which I always thought was great. <laughs> and it was really. Really, like, I, I don't know what this is. And, and he was a genius in these rare diseases, but he just, you know, he knew every now and then. And often we didn't know either, but still it was, that, that, that wasn't the point. The point was we were on the radar and, and it did matter. So it sounds like you've got a lot going on. Do any big changes coming up in the, in the future? Or Expanding at St. Joe's, which is really exciting. I'm going to be doing more days there per week. And then we're building out a lab, which is not in, you know, the immediate timeline, but hopefully you... 12 to 18 months to be in a new space in the hospital, which would be great. A little bit nicer than our current, you know, physical infrastructure, but great team there. I mean, the walls don't matter as much as your team. <laughs> you need nice surgical supplies, even if your walls aren't nice. Well, you know, listen, that's great. I mean, all these things that had promise, it's always nice when promises come into reality. And you can't take that for granted. You know, I've seen things change literally overnight of things we worked on years to get it done. And then there was a change in the politics and go for a meeting that was supposed to be celebratory, but it's like, yeah, we're not going to do it. <laughs> it's like, oh. you know, so um, yeah, listen, hang in there. That's really, really great. Just in case people aren't really sure about what Mohs surgery is, can you just briefly describe how you explain what Mohs surgery is and when you do it, why you do it? Yeah. So it's staged skin cancer removal for a non-melanoma skin cancer, which is basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and almost exclusively on the head and neck in areas that are tricky to treat, like near the eye or near the nose, where you want to spare normal tissue. So you want to remove the cancer with the narrowest margin possible. And the way it works is that patients come in usually early in the morning, mark the cancer with a marking pen, freeze it with local anesthetic, little freezing needles, remove the cancer with a scalpel and we take that tissue and relax it down, sort of making a three-dimensional shape into a two-dimensional shape so that all of the margins can be frozen in a cryostat and then examined under a microscope. The patient has a bandage put on, it's kind of an open wound and, and they're waiting an hour or so while that tissue is processed. And what is tricky with some of these non-melanoma skin cancers, like a sclerosing basal cells, that they can have roots under the skin, like roots under a tree. So they're often much bigger than they initially appear. And then when I look under the microscope, so the dermatologist acts as both the surgeon and the pathologist. And so when I look under the microscope, I can see if any of the margins are positive. And if they are, I know exactly where I have to go back. So I can take another millimeter of skin just from where I need to you know, for example, you know, sparing the skin near the eyelid or, or near the edge of the nose, which is much more complicated to reconstruct. 
and keep doing that back and forth till we get 100% clear margins. At that point, there's a hole or a surgical defect after the tumor has been removed, and that has to be reconstructed. That's sort of the creative and, and nice part of my job where I get to use my right brain to see you know, how to fix these holes in a way that will provide optimal cosmesis, minimize scarring and look as nice as possible when it's healed. And so, you know, sometimes there's function that has to be restored, like keeping the nostril open when you breathe and also having everything look nice and symmetric and minimizing scar lines within the the relaxed skin tension lines of of the face. And I'm a perfectionist and I like to think I'm a bit of an artist and, you know, I want people to look as nice as possible you know, and if their scar is not perfect, I want them to come back and I want to make it perfect. And that, you know, part where I get to be a little bit creative and work with my hands and and really be able to focus on on perfection is something that I just, I love about my job. And Mo's has very high care rates (laughs) because we're treating rude. That's awesome. A great description. Actually, I was going to ask you about more and more we're seeing things, at least I'm seeing things that are, if I interpret it correctly, it looks like there may be drug therapies for women cell carcinomas and, and, and things like that. Is that really close or are we really, you know, surgery is still going to be surgery. And if there is other stuff, it might just be ancillary and a little bit of a help, but not really the answer. I would say for now, surgery is surgery. It's really hard to to beat it, even with sort of new technologies that are coming down the line. I'm working with this eye knife group in Kingston, looking at, you know, maybe looking at surgical smoke and and then they do like a spectrometry on it and like, I don't know, to an- analyze tumor. Um, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff in, in the works, but right now I think surgery is surgery and there may be a drug that's developed that makes most surgery obsolete. And that certainly could happen as far as I know, nothing like that currently exists and nothing like that in the pipeline right now, but who knows, six months from now, 12 months from now could be a different story. I, I'm no surgeon. I've never been one, but I, I do remember being taught a, a chance to cut is a chance to cure. And I think that's basically true. Uh, you know, if you a chance to cut is a chance to cure. And, you know, people, why am I here? Well, because we're going for a cure. This is, and a word that is not always clear, you know, what do you mean by cure? Well, could it come back? Yes. But basically that's the idea is that, right? You just want to get rid of it all and it's behind you. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, people come in in the morning with cancer and they leave without it in the afternoon. Like it couldn't be a more satisfying job. I mean, you're doing medical dermatology, you're treating a lot of conditions that are, are quite challenging to treat, you know, and it's a lot of apologies. I mean, there's also a lot of things we can treat and people do very well with in medical dermatology, but uh, skin cancer is just the best. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's really great. I'm so glad you could do that because you've got that breadth of talent in so many domains uh, to be able to put all of that to use. Stop it. No, it's true. And to put all of that to use is like, uh, everything. I was just talking about the artistry as well as the passion and the medical knowledge and et cetera, et cetera, and the team. I mean, it's just, it's really, you know, listen, not many people can do all that. And, and so uh, it's, congratulations on doing it. It really makes everybody proud, but also very, uh, I, we're in awe that you could do that. Believe me, it's just an amazing thing. Oh, I feel lucky. I feel lucky every day at my job. I'm so, I feel so lucky to get to be doing Mo's and it just, uh, yeah. I feel truly blessed and lucky. I mean, I remember working with you in clinic and you could just talk to people all day long and like, you know, just cracking jokes and you made everybody happy. And like that type of dermatology was, it was challenging for me when I was doing it in, in general derm clinics and a lot of, of talking, like the fact that I can have some time without talking in my day. I mean, I don't have those skills that you have. So do you listen to rock music while you're uh, doing surgery or do you- In Kingston, I listen to country music mostly. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. I know that's a big thing about surgeons sometimes is the, you go into, I was, when we used to go collect tissue and I was at sick kids for studies we were doing and the surgeon always had the music blaring in the surgery. I mean, the people were out so they didn't have to hear it, or at least we don't think they did. But it, I guess for many people, it just helps you uh, either relax and focus on the issue at hand. So I love the music. I hate the banter though. When like the, you know, it's a radio, we don't have any like fancy, you know, system of you know, serious or whatever. It's just the radio and the, the jockey banter is gets to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it'd be, you know, there's just so for anybody going for surgery, they'll know to uh, expect that there may be music. Anyway, well, Aaron, anything else you want to 
bring up before we uh, let you get back to work, I guess. But uh... I just wanted to let you know that I love the name for your podcast and all of the names of things you have created over the years, like, you know, boss and glide and drive and tops <laughs> and all those things. And I was wondering, um, maybe you should have done like a, a sheer 10 for the score 10. That, that would have been good. Well, you know what? Since you bring that up, we almost did. We were at one of our meetings in France and we were reviewing what is now dress and talking about it, but we didn't really have a name for it. And Jean-Claude Rougeau, who passed away last year, was was the head of this. And, and he didn't want to hear it, but one of the dermatologists from Paris said, oh, we should call it Shear syndrome. And he had S's for, I don't know, skin. He had worked it all out, actually. And, and that made Jean-Claude insane, I think. I think it's killed him. His whole, the rest of his life was to make sure that never happened. But it was really funny. And yeah, in the beginning, I mean, we didn't really have names for any of these things, except, I mean, dermatology side effects like big rashes. There were a couple of names thrown around, but it was never really standardized. Uh, in a way. And now that we're getting into it, we have a big dress meeting over the weekend. And it's all, you know, all the patients are saying, well, we've had it. Now now what happens? So they're creating their own group to, you know, make sure. But then there's all these overlaps with all the other immune syndromes. And as you can imagine, so, you know, like with cancer, you could have one, but people with one cancer are more likely to have two cancers. So, you know, you expect there may be other things going on. Anyway, it is a journey. It's all a journey. And, you know, you just, sometimes you'll take a look in the rearview mirror to see where you've been. But it is more fun to look forward, I think, to look out the front. And that's what I'm so glad. Thank you so much for taking your time and everything to do this and for your contributions. Uh, It's just great. We're so lucky in our country to have such talented people like you. My pleasure. And thank you. Thank you for your contribution and doing this. I listened to all the episodes. It was so fun. Like, I just feel like we have such a a nice community of dermatologists in Canada. And it's just so nice that like everyone likes each other. And I don't know, just these conversations were so special to listen to. So I'm honored to be part of it. It is good. And I, and I'm very proud of too in Southern Ontario, especially in Toronto, the diversity there is really, really real. I mean, it's there, you you know, you walk down the street, whether you're listening to Polish in one area and Chinese dialect in another area, you know, up and down the streets. I mean, we're very, really living this diverse thing. So, and there's a lot of good things that are going to be coming from that, I think, with the ethnodermatology chair and stuff like that. So that's very exciting, especially to do that in Toronto, I think is very exciting. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Nice to see you. If you enjoyed this episode of Sheer Listening Pleasure, please do share it with your friends and colleagues. On our next episode, Neil will chat with another guest from the world of dermatology. To subscribe, go to www.derm.city or find the SLP podcast at Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Spotify, or, really, wherever you get your podcasts. The producer is Jeremy Visser. Research for this episode came from Christella Teller Ruiz, John Evans, and Kylie Rebenick. Support for this podcast comes from Amgen Canada. Amgen Canada serves dermatology patients throughout Canada by delivering vital medicines to them. In addition, Amgen contributes to developing new therapies, or new uses for existing medicines, in partnership with many of Canada's leading healthcare, academic, research, government, and patient organizations. Today, tens of thousands of Canadians use Amgen medicines every year. Learn more at www.amgen.ca. Send your comments to slp at chronicle.org. Until next time, be well.